Good morning, everybody, um, and welcome to B-Sides Las Vegas. This talk, built hybrid mobile application like a security pro, is given by Vanida, a security researcher from Synopsys. A few announce announcements before we begin. We would like to thank our sponsors, especially our diamond sponsor, Adobe, and our gold sponsors, Prisma Cloud, SEMGREP, BlueCat, PlexTrack, Toyota, Conductor One. It's their support along with our other sponsors, donors and volunteers that make this event possible. We have policies about cell phones and these talks are being streamed live, except in the underground. As a courtesy to our speakers and audi audience, we ask that you check to make sure your cell phones are set to silent. Please, if you have a question, use the audience microphone right there to ask, or you can check with me or any other person if you want to use it or ask questions. You may be asked to make announcements. Uh, so as a reminder, the B-Side Las Vegas photo uh, policy prohibit taking pictures without the explicit permission of everyone in the frame. These talks are, being, are also being recorded, except in on the ground, and will be available on YouTube in the future. Please move over to this side of the room and uh, enjoy your talk. Thank you and welcome, Vanita. Hi, thank you. Hi, everyone. Good morning. My name is Vinita. Welcome to my session, Build Hybrid Mobile Apps Like a Security Pro. I also go by the name Vinny, like my cousin Vinny, in case that name is too hard. Uh, so let's get started. So a little bit about me. I am a security researcher at Synopsys, and my job involves evaluating frameworks and new languages. And all of this research goes into static analysis tools that will help catch instances where those libraries are implemented insecurely. Before this, I was actually in the consulting, working in the field, doing pen tests and source code reviews of uh, mobile apps and web applications. So uh, most of my clients were in the financial or healthcare industry. I live in the Indianapolis area, and uh, when I'm not working, I like to do things that keep me off screens, like learning new dance forms. Uh, I learned a bit of violin. And I also like to be outdoorsy and go on hikes. However, my current obsession is all about growing some vegetables in my apartment patio. And I'm here for 10 days. I'm pretty sure they'll be dead when I go back home. All right, so in today's session, we're first going to set the foundation and talk about some basic concepts about mobile applications, like their characteristics, what they're made of, uh, what their threat model is like, how it's different from that of a web application. And then we'll go over some basic concepts about mobile apps as well. And then we'll go over certain principles of application security and see how you can use them to build hybrid mobile apps securely. You can build them really fast, but it's also important to build them securely, and we'll use those principles to understand how to do that. At the end of the session, I have a fun little interactive exercise planned for you all, where I'll show you some insecure pieces of code, and if you correctly identify the insecure line of code, I have some goodies to give away. So uh, we'll then wrap it up and summarize everything we've learned today and open it up to questions. So going back to basics, how many of you here have built mobile apps before? OK. How many of you have been on the other end of the spectrum and hacked or broken mobile apps before? OK, I've got more hackers here. OK, great. OK, so just really quick, some one-on-one -on -one for mobile apps. Uh, initially, mobile apps were just for productivity, right? Like to check your calendar, your email, your planner. If you remember, BlackBerry was one of the first ones who made this available to use on the go. But now, mobile apps are not for productivity, I think. They're for everything else. They're for uh, calling a cab, ordering food, looking at the sky and identifying stars. And I hear there's a mobile app to hunt down ghosts. I really hope that doesn't work. 
And 99% uh, of these mobile applications uh, cater towards two main operating systems, Apple, iOS, and Android, which is owned by Google. Um, all of these mobile applications are built using software development kits, or SDKs, and typically there is there is one SDK per platform, which means there is one for Android, usually based on Java and Kotlin, and there's another for iOS, and it's usually based on Swift and Objective-C. So when you have a SDK per platform, what's the biggest downside to that? Does anybody know? Yeah. Uh, you have to build code for all these different platforms. Correct, yes. So to repeat that answer, the downside is that you have to start building uh, the code from scratch again when you start uh, supporting new platforms, which is a lot of duplication of effort. And that is where hybrid applications came into being, where you can just pick a framework like React Native or Xamarin, Cordova, what have you, and you code just once, you test just once, and then you build it based on the platform that you want to support, which means your developers have now saved a lot of time. Uh, these applications are came to be known as cross-platform apps or hybrid applications, and they tend to have a lot of web components in them. Uh, for the rest of this talk, we'll try to uh, use the word hybrid apps to refer to cross-platform apps as well as hybrid apps. Um, some characteristics about mobile applications. Every mobile app on your phone is running on its own isolated environment. What that means is that that application process only has access to the data in its own isolated environment. This environment is usually referred to as a container or a sandbox, and to talk to other applications on the device or access data in a different sandbox, it would need the right permissions and it has to leverage inter-process communication. Fun fact about why it's called a sandbox. Imagine a bunch of kids playing in a big sandbox. Now, I don't have kids, but I've been told that's a recipe for disaster because kids don't want to share and it will lead to fights. So what do you do? You split them up and put them in their own sandbox and everything's jolly. So apparently that's how the term sandbox came into being in the mobile world. Anyway, so uh, mobile applications tend to have a lot of code and a lot of data on the device because it cannot bother the server every time it wants to access some data that you as a user frequently request. For example, your display picture, your username, your email address, it tends to store this data on the device so that it can quickly grab it and render it in your mobile application because you probably open your mobile app more often than you do web apps. So mobile apps tend to do that. And in terms of how it would communicate with the server, it's not very different from that of a web application. It would typically make calls to the server using REST or SOAP API calls. Authentication is something interesting in mobile apps because in web apps, you would probably use username and passwords to log in every single time. I'll try to stay here. Uh, you probably are going to use usernames and passwords every single time you want to log in. But mobile apps make this easy. They make re-authentication easy because mobile apps can leverage the biometric authentication and the passcode that you already have on your device, which means mobile apps could save some session information or username and passwords or JWT tokens. They tend to save them on the device. Now, everything we've discussed so far is what the uh, what the mobile OS provides by default in terms of security context, but this is your device. You probably want to tweak it and customize it for your own like liking. Imagine you had a laptop and you did not have root access or admin access on it. You wouldn't be cool with that. Similarly, some users like to have the ability to really own that device and make it work for them and not have to work within boundaries. So such users could jailbreak or root their phone which from a higher level means you're just disabling all of these security features and isolation. But hey, you can download that cute little emoji keyboard, right? So going over the threat model of mobile applications, in my opinion, one of the biggest assets in mobile apps is data. Now in web apps too, data is an asset, but in web apps, most of the data tends to be on the server side, in a database or on the cloud. But in 
mobile applications, like we discussed before, a lot of sensitive data could be stored on the device, so it's a very big asset. Similarly, the code of a mobile application could be on the device, which means that it's not just UI code. There could actually be some validation code. There could be something more interesting than just like low impact UI code. So that is also a very big asset. And we discussed about how user credentials or session information could also be stored on the device. So threat agents to all these assets could be um, other malicious apps on the device, or it could be someone who has stolen your phone, especially if it's jailbroken. Maybe it's easier to access that data. Uh, and uh, users are also threat agents because at the end of the day, an attacker is a user and they're trying to understand your app to understand how to break it. But in general, the likelihood of a successful attack on your mobile application is considered low because first of all, the attacker has to uh, stay up to date with all of the security updates that uh, these OSs are making very frequently. Number two, the attacker may need an already compromised environment or has to chain a bunch of vulnerabilities to get a, to get a high impact vulnerability. So that is why, in general, it's mobile application exploits are considered to have low likelihood. OK, so now let's get into hybrid mobile applications, which is why you're here. So like we discussed before, what is a hybrid mobile application? It is something that you just code and build once, and you can release it for multiple platforms. And it's not just for mobile OSs. It could also be for Linux or Mac OS or even on web browsers. So it's, it's gotten really, really easy to build hybrid mobile applications thanks to these platforms, uh, thanks to these frameworks. And, um, and these frameworks tend to be uh, Cordoba or Ionic, Flutter, React Native, and uh, because these frameworks have made it so easy, hybrid applications are on the rise. In fact, according to a recent statistic, uh, a lot of the retail applications in the market right now are built through one of these frameworks. So just a fun fact. So how would you go about building these hybrid mobile applications? It's just like any other mobile app. You start by creating your widgets, your UI, except in hybrid mobile applications, a lot of this is already done for you. A lot of this is already pre-built and tested and made available to you through libraries. And uh, when I talk about libraries, I like to use this example. They, uh, uh, consider you're trying to make a big bowl of chili for a barbecue. You're probably not going to go and get all of the individual ingredients and cut it up and chop it up and add it to your chili. You're probably going to get canned beans and canned corn and add it and save time. So similarly, with hybrid mobile applications, a lot of the functionalities, not just for UI, whether you want to implement data storage or uh, talking to the server or uh, trying to implement biometric authentication, all of this code is already tested for multiple platforms and made available on package managers like npm or pub.dev, depending on the framework. And you can just like grab that library and plug it into your code, and you just have that functionality like that. This is another reason why hybrid mobile applications are really easy and very popular, uh, because it's so easy to create. These libraries are usually maintained through uh, open source or through the community of that framework. And currently, here are some numbers. Flutter has 36,000 libraries, and React Native has 46,000 libraries. And that number is just growing. It's just making it easier and easier to plug in and play your hybrid mobile applications. Here are some examples of hybrid mobile applications in the market right now, some really famous ones, uh, BMW, Skype, Walmart, so many of them. Here's an example of what a library would typically look like. Here on the right side, you can see that the library's name is Local Auth. It's a Flutter library. It's maintained by the package manager pub.dev. Um, you can see that it supports three platforms, Android, iOS, and Windows. It seems quite popular, 99% popularity, and it's maintained by uh, the verified publisher of Flutter. Now, if you're a developer, you would probably stop at this page of the library documentation, or maybe you would go to the installing page or look at an example, see how you can implement it. But how many of us really go deeper and understand how these APIs work? Do we really look at it from a security perspective? I don't know. So we learn how to do that in this talk. 
So here's an example sample code of how you would use this library. So you would add this library as a dependency, you would import it into your project, and then it's as simple as calling the Authenticate API to implement biometric authentication for your user. If you didn't have this library, you probably will have, I don't know, three times as many lines of code to implement this. So libraries really make it easy. Now, uh, I saw that there are a lot of hackers here. Can anyone recognize what's wrong with this code? Is there anything insecure? So if you're a pen tester and you've hacked mobile applications before, you will see that this API returns a Boolean value. And if you've hacked mobile apps before, you know that it's extremely trivial to flip the switch on a false Boolean to a true Boolean and trick the app into thinking that authentication actually passed, but it would have failed. So uh, such kind of validation is considered insecure. It's called um, event-based validation, and we will talk about that more in a future slide. Okay, so we've talked about hybrid mobile apps. We talked about the fact that you may be building these hybrid apps through a bunch of libraries from the open source, it's third party. So I researched this. I researched such things in my job. So why don't I just give you a list of secure libraries for every framework, for every functionality? I could do that, but what if that library gets outdated? Or what if there's a CVE in the future, or it gets associated with a supply chain issue? What would you do then? So let's take an alternate approach and go by this. If you recognize what this means, it translates to if you give a person a fish, they'll just eat once. But if you, give, if you teach that man how to fish, they will eat forever. So we'll take a similar approach today and see how we can evaluate libraries on our own. And uh, to do that, we will take the help of five principles of application security today and see how you can uh, comply by them, use them when you're picking libraries or when you're writing your hybrid mobile application from scratch. It doesn't matter, these, these principles will really help you. Okay, so the first principle I have is called the principle of least privilege. And what it means is that less is more. Or that you need to have a granular permission model when you're building an application, web or mobile, it doesn't matter. You need to work on the least number of privilege, privileges that you can get by with. So mobile applications need the user's permission to access a lot of features on the device, like Bluetooth, or location, or uh, Apple Pay, a lot of things, or photos. So user has to explicitly grant permission to the user to do this. Uh, but your application shouldn't ask for permissions it doesn't really need. Like you may not want to think that, oh, maybe I'll need it in a future release, I'll just ask the permission. It doesn't work like that. Users will get suspicious and you may also violate some data privacy laws depending on where you're using that application. So let's take an example to understand this principle. Assume that there is a music streaming app like Spotify and that app asks permissions for your device's Bluetooth. It's fine, it probably wants to connect to a speaker. But what if it asks permission to your camera or microphone? It probably doesn't need that permission, it is suspicious, it's violating this principle. Let's take another example, a food delivery app. Can someone name a suspicious permission it can ask? Context. Context. Yes, correct, yes, that is the correct answer. Uh, so when you're building a your mobile application, you probably want to make sure, can I throw it to you? I will try. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, great. So when you're building a your mobile application, you probably want to work on the minimum set of permissions. And when we talk about hybrid mobile applications, uh, you may be using a lot of libraries for different functionalities like data storage or uh, biometric authentication or web views. So you want to make sure that the library is not asking for permissions that you don't really need. And even if it does, you want to make sure that they're configurable, that you're able to turn them off, and they're not, and the library is not forcing an insecure default on you. You may also be using libraries that help you uh, handle these permissions, like checking if the user already granted a permission, or maybe you can, it, it, it helps you uh, ask the user for permission at runtime. 
So in either case, it's important to again have a known set of permissions you want to allow and uh, make sure that you're explaining to the user why you need the permission so that they can make an informed decision. Applications also tend to expose some of their functionalities in the form of say intents or universal links. And you may want to put some restrictions there too and not expose it to all applications on the device. You can make use of app groups, make the app belong to a certain group of applications so that you uh, expose your functionalities only there. Or you could even make use of what the native OS provides like one-time access or signature-based permissions. You can leverage all of that which libraries may not provide. The next principle I have for you is called security by obscurity. And yes, that is my cat hiding behind my plants. And she thinks she's obscure, but she's not. So uh, what this principle means is that if the inner workings of your application are completely hidden, you're safe. That doesn't sound right, does it? And you would be correct. That is a myth, and that has long been debunked. Uh, but let's think about this principle from a mobile application perspective. We discussed how mobile applications are very client heavy, which means a lot of the code and data is actually present on the device. So maybe this principle can be helpful. Assume that you released your application without any obscurity or obfuscation, and an attacker can download this application. They don't even need an account on your application. They can just decompile, unpack your application, understand what's going on, understand the different methods and classes, and they can use that information to perform targeted attacks at your users or, to, or at your server. So you want to make this really hard for the attacker. And how you can do that is make your code really hard to understand. Now, if you're a bad coder like me, then you're probably already there. It's already obfuscated. No one can understand it. But if you want to do it the right way, make sure that in your hybrid application, any framework that you pick, any library that you pick, uh, make sure that the obfuscation options it provides work for all the platforms you, platforms you want to support and that these options work for uh, all the languages in your source code and not just the code that it comes with. All of these frameworks come with their own languages, like React Native comes with JavaScript, Flutter comes with Dart, and sometimes these code obfuscation options could only work for those languages, but you don't want that. You want to have coverage for everything in your repository. Um, some other ways that you can uh, obfuscate your data is by using uh, code splitting, which is exactly as it sounds. It's breaking up your code into multiple pieces so that it's harder for an attacker to put two and two together. So moving on to data in your application, you know, all the data that's on the client side, you want it hidden, you want it obscured from an attacker's pro malicious process or hands. So how do you do that? One way, obviously, is to encrypt any sensitive data that you're st storing on such an exposed client-side environment. So when you're using libraries in your hybrid mobile application to handle data, like fetching data from a location, or writing data to a location, or sending data to the network, in all of these cases, make sure that you're encrypting sensitive data. Make sure that the library actually supports safe encryption. And please don't use in-house crypto. You probably want to make good choices when it comes to encryption algorithms, key generation algorithms, hashing algorithms, and uh, even the key size. You want to make good options there because the library is going to give you a lot of algorithms that you can pick from. So it's up to you to make the safe choice there. Now, an interesting challenge you'll come across when you go to implement in encryption in your mobile app, which is, where will you store the encryption key? It's the client side. Does anyone have an answer? Yes. Yes, correct. Yeah, you can do that. Any other answers? Yes. Yes, correct. Yes. So a lot of options here. One answer was do PB, PBKDF2 derivation. One was using the secure enclave. All these are correct answers. So you can always save encryption keys that uh, in a location that is backed by OS security. For example, a keychain. This is backed by uh, the uh, security that Secure Enclaves provide, so that's a great option. Uh, you also want to make sure that you're obfuscating any data that you're displaying to the user, especially sensitive data like passwords and social security numbers, especially if they're going to come to DEF CON and other conferences. You don't want them to enter payment information in such a public area. So make sure that uh, when you go to build 
uh, uh, display forms or forms that take in user input, sensitive user input, make sure that the library supports masking of sensitive data. Moving on to the next principle, it's called minimize the attack surface. And what this means is that, what, what exactly is an at attack surface? It's all of the en uh, entry points into your application that an attacker can leverage and launch exploits through. Now, if you want a secure app, you probably want to keep the number of such entry points to the absolute minimum. And uh, in mobile applications, there are a lot of ways through which data can enter your application. A lot of untrusted data can enter your application. And in my opinion, in hybrid mobile applications, the biggest culprit to open up your app and take in uh, untrusted input are web views. A web view is like having a tiny little web browser in your mobile application that, that hosts or loads an external web page. Now, you may be trusting this web page, but if you think back, you're again violating, to some extent, the least privileged principle because you're trusting something external and loading it in the context of your application. So when we talk about web views, obviously there are web elements like HTML and uh, JavaScript. And when I talk about JavaScript, we have to mention the vulnerability. Anybody knows? JavaScript, XSS, yes, correct, yes. So uh, XSS is scary. Sorry, I get it here. So XSS is scary, but it's especially scary in mobile applications because because this script, this untrusted script, could actually have access to the sandbox in your, of your application. Or maybe your application has permissions to other components in your device, like contacts or Bluetooth, and the script could actually have permissions to all these applications because of your app. So you want to make sure that when you build web views, I'm sorry, the mic is just echoing a lot here. OK, that's better. So when you're building web views, just make sure that uh, you're validating any inputs that are coming in through untrusted sources. And it's not just user input. Some other untrusted sources could be the clipboard or the system keyboard, because everything on the device has access to them. So you want to make sure that anything coming in to your hybrid mobile application is getting validated and uh, sanitized. And uh, when you pick a library to handle all of this user input for you to create forms, for example, make sure that the library supports you um, in performing such validations. Uh, when we talk about attack surfaces, it's also important to mention deep links and Android intents. And what that means is that you are exposing certain functionalities to some other applications through something like a URL. And this URL can actually have query parameters. And these query parameters can enter your application and corrupt what's in your sandbox. So again, you want to make sure that you thoroughly validate them. And it's always best to keep it to the absolute minimum and not accept untrusted data unless absolutely necessary. You want to limit such functionalities. Here is some sample code about an insecure web view. As you can see, you have created a, a web view. And then you are injecting, at runtime, some JavaScript that will take user input and uh, manipulate the inner HTML of that web page. So this is really bad, and it will open up your application to a lot of injection attacks. So we've talked about how untrusted input could enter your application and cause trouble. But there are also other ways where you increase your attack surface. And one of that is. Uh, writing data or leaking data onto untrusted locations on your device. So you want to make sure that when you pick libraries for your hybrid mobile application, you want to make sure that it does not do any excessive logging. You want to make sure that you follow good practices and not log sensitive data or uh, save user data on a location that's outside your control, like external storage. You want to make sure that you keep it locked down and uh, leverage what the native OS provides to keep everything secure and isolated. All right, the next principle I have is called the principle of client trust. And what this essentially means is that you shouldn't trust the user using your device, and you shouldn't trust the environment in which your application is running. I like to use the phrase trusted on busted. What that, what that means is that trusted code is running on a busted environment. 
And uh, you want to make sure that your application stays resilient and protects the user even in such a compromised environment. So let's break this down and see what it means, what trust means in each of these components. Let's talk about libraries first. We talked about how hybrid mobile applications are probably going to build, be built with libraries, and these libraries are third party. So obviously, third party risks are inherent. You cannot avoid that. But you could have some practices to make sure that you are mitigating the risk that comes from these third party libraries. Uh, which involves performing periodic software composition analysis so that you have an idea of all of your dependencies and what that opens you up to. And you want to make sure that the library is from a verified publisher. You want to make sure that there are no CVEs. And uh, you also want to make sure that uh, all of the security controls the library provides works work all across the platforms that you want to support. Now, let's talk about the network. How does the client know that it's talking to the right server counterpart. Does anyone know? How do mobile apps do that? Yeah, yeah, correct. Yeah, so the answer is certificate pinning. Yeah, so the answer is certificate pinning. And uh, in your hybrid mobile application, you may be using a library to do this for you. Again, it's important to understand how that certificate pinning API works. Make sure that it doesn't return a Boolean value. It's not event-based, because we saw how easy it is for an attacker to flip that switch and trick the app into believing that it is talking to the right server, where it may not be doing that. And the native OS also provides a lot of good uh, network configuration controls to make sure that uh, the app is talking to the right server. In Apple, the option you have is to use application transport security settings. It's usually just a configuration file or plist file where you can specify a lot of network security options like forward secrecy or uh, enforcing HTTPS communication with the server, a lot of those options. Uh, moving on to the user. Why shouldn't you trust the user? Because at the end of the day, a user could be a hacker, again, who's trying to break your application. Or there are two other kinds of users, the extremely tech savvy one who probably jailbroke their phone and has some suspicious apps on their phone, or the extremely non-tech savvy user like my grandmother who probably has clicked all links and installed all kinds of malware. So you want to be, you want to make sure that your app actually is safeguarded even in such an environment. You want to help the user make good choices. You also want to protect the user from themselves. How do you do that? Let's take an example. Say that your uh, user has downloaded a third-party keyboard, and they're using this keyboard to even enter sensitive data in your application. That's a great way to, for attackers to harvest credentials of your application. So as an app de developer, what you could do is you could enforce the system keyboard for such sensitive uh, fields which means you have to force the user to only use the system keyboard and disallow any other third-party keyboards from being used, especially when it comes to such sensitive areas in your application. So when you pick a library to handle user input in your hybrid mobile application, make sure that it supports such, um, such kind of uh, enforcement of keyboards. You want to make sure that uh, you help the user this way and uh, help them make good choices. Um, you also want to make sure that uh, when you're using uh, the keyboard, uh, you want to make sure that the user is not able to bypass that enforcement that you have. There are some ways where, again, it's event-based, so it will be bypassable. So you want to make sure, again, that it's not uh, event-based. The next principle I have, the last one, is called defense in depth. And uh, this is what this essentially means is that you should strive for holistic security you want to make sure that you have multiple controls in place so that if one fails, you have others protecting you from chaining of vulnerabilities and hence avoiding a domino effect. Um, there are different defense and depth strategies you can take in uh, mobile applications, one of which is uh, ensuring that your application does not run in a jailbroken environment. So does anyone know how you could do this without using library? How do you detect? that a user's device is jailbroken. Yeah, this is a hard question. Yeah. Uh, using like functions that will be the Islam as well. Uh, trying to hold the process, for example, on iOS. 
Yes, correct. So the answer that came from the audience is that uh, you want to ensure that you're not able to fork a process, you're not able to uh, run certain processes or open certain files. I think that's what you said. So yeah, I'm going to try to do this. Let's see. If I hurt someone, please don't sue me. Oh, thank you. Sorry about that. OK, great. So uh, yes, that is the correct answer. If you were implementing jailbreak detection uh, in the native code, you probably have like several different checks you can bundle together and ensure that it's not it's not jailbroken. But see, in hybrid mobile applications, you're probably going to use a library to do jailbreak detection for you. And what these libraries will do is that it will bundle all of these multiple checks into one single API call so that you can just call that API and depend on that API to check for jailbreak. And now this API will again return a Boolean value, which is again very easy to bypass. So what can we do? What should you look for? You still probably want to use such APIs, but you want to use it securely. So when you pick such jailbreak detection libraries, make sure that it is result-based and not event-based. Result-based means that it doesn't return a Boolean. It returns like a type. So it's harder for attackers to, uh, to spoof that. And uh, some other defense in-depth strategies would be uh, making sure that it is running on the latest OS version of that platform, because typically the latest OS versions have all of the security updates in place, and hence it is harder to uh, bypass it. And you also want to have some anti-reverse engineering uh, controls in place, not allow any debuggers to be attached to your application process. You also want to make sure there's no debug code or development code left over in your source code. Uh, there are some frameworks where uh, there could be some debug or development code in your repository, and it doesn't get stripped when you uh, get it ready for the release. So you want to watch out for such things. And um, in general, you want to make sure that the library is clean, not associated with any supply chain risks, no CVEs, is being kept up to date, it's actively maintained. You also want to make sure that there are no deprecated methods. That's a big one. A lot of the libraries have a lot of deprecated methods that, uh, that, uh, that a native OS probably cannot understand. So it might malfunction and open it up to security issues. So you want to watch out for that. So that was the last principle I had. So now we can play that exercise that I said. So I'm going to show you some library documentation. Uh, I've got three libraries that I'm going to show you, so I have three chances. Um, and if you correctly identify what is an insecure option or an insecure line of code in that library documentation, uh, I'll give you that little orange ball. So the first library I have is uh, something that you can use to hash data. And it lets you pick some hashing algorithms uh, to hash that data. So here's that API, and here are some options. Can someone recognize what's bad here? Yes. Yes, correct. Yes, yeah. Any other? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'll give you another one. Forget about it. Uh, yes, that is correct. I think I already gave you one, right? No? Here. I'm sorry. All right, so the next one I have is a library that does cert pinning, but you don't need to know what is cert pinning. It's that obvious what is insecure. Any, any guesses? Yeah? The, this one? Yes, correct. So if you can see, this library lets you disable all security, which means you can disable cert pinning for that, for that uh, application. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. <laughs> it's a good idea. No, I was going to get ready to. But there's so many obstacles on your way. I'll hit someone in the head. <laughs> so yeah, so disable all security is an option that this library provides. Thankfully, it's not set to true by default. So this is an option that you can use to disable cert pinning for a specific URL. So the next option. The next library I have is something to launch a web view in your hybrid app. And these are all the options you can configure the web view with. So last library. This one is a little controversial, but I'll wait till you guess it. A 
Okay, I'll give you a hint. It's something to do with bullion. <laughs> yes, yes. Yes, correct, yes. I am so happy that that was the last question. This is my last one. <laughs> Okay, great. So uh, yes, that is correct. Which JavaScript is set to true? You probably don't want to create web views with JavaScript running by default. You want to turn it on on an as needed basis because we talked about it earlier. It's just increasing your attack surface. It's not a good defense and dip strategy to keep it on by default. That's an insecure default. Okay, so let's summarize. I think, yes, I think we're on time. So to summarize, hybrid applications are really, really easy to build. They're really, really easy to just plug in and play and support multiple platforms, multiple users at once. So you want to make sure that when you build one, you're building it securely. And if you're not a developer here, you're someone who manages some developers who help, who support the security aspect of application development in your company. You can support them by maybe having them uh, take a course on uh, the security aspect of the framework that they decide on during the design phase of the SDLC process. So maybe that is something you can do. If you're a developer and if you're trying to pick libraries to implement different functionalities when you go to code this hybrid mobile app, make sure that you really scrutinize this library and understand what the API does. Go past the example page in the documentation, go deeper into the API documentation, and make sure that it does not have some uh, insecure defaults, is not using event-based authentication or event-based validation, and uh, you want to make sure it does not it does not have CVEs, and if they are, it's patched. You keep the library up to date. All of these great get controls. And do not forget that the, uh, that the native OS actually is trying to help you. It has a lot of controls that you can also leverage. So make sure that you complement your security controls with the OS's controls. OK, so real quick, here are some resources that you can use when you are more interested in this topic. Uh, I, like, I like the MASTG guide by OASP. It's not necessarily for building apps, but it's more for getting a perspective from the, from the attacker's perspective to understand how a mobile application could be broken. There is the OWASP Mobile Top 10. Um, it gives you the top 10 vulnerabilities right now for mobile applications. And uh, right now, they just came out with their initial release for 2023, if you're interested. Uh, there is the NIST document for mobile device security. This is not really for mobile apps, but more in general, how mobile devices are used and what OSs could provide. And lastly, there's the OASP cheat sheet series, where uh, it's a quick reference for developers in case they want to refer to some security controls per uh, category or per concept in your mobile application. I would also like to mention that it's not a bad idea to read the security context documentation that OSs release. It's really not technical jargon. It's actually very easy to read. I've, I've read the Apple's iOS security context document. It's, it's really not bad. It's not like a user agreement, so it's not boring. So I would really recommend reading that too, because then you'll understand how the native OS works and how it tightly integrates these security APIs so that you can leverage them when you go to build your hybrid mobile app. With that, I will thank you all, first of all, for coming. Thank you for B-Sides. And any questions, I'm here. If you don't catch me here, I'll be outside. So thank you, everyone, for coming. Please, if you have questions, you will come over here to ask. Thank you. Okay, I guess no questions. That's uh, okay. There you are. Thanks. There we go. One of the big things that I like to do when, when I'm implementing stuff is put uh, checks in like the continuous integration environment. Do you have any like ideas or recommendations about like static analysis tools that you can use as a part of because it's easy to check once, but like I may not remember, you know, six months from now, whether or not that library is still maintained or whether it's, you know, on the latest version of the mobile operating system. Um, is that something that you have any recommendations on? Uh, yes. So um, there are a lot of static code analysis tools. There are free versions and paid versions, but all of them uh, have all of these rules that you can use to uh, identify such insecure implementation of libraries. Uh, now, I'm from Synopsys. Synopsys has a great static code analysis tool that you can use as an IDE plugin so that 
developers can catch it even before it hits the pipeline. You can put pre-commit hooks and what have you. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think, does that answer your question? I'm not supposed to mention tools. I, I signed an agreement. <laughs> okay. All right, any other questions? Okay, well, uh, thank you all for coming. Have a great conference. Thanks. Thank you.